Hello, and welcome to the fifth episode of Capital Markets Live. I am John Getches, Senior Vice President of Capital Markets at Ginny Bay. And today I am joined by Lori Goodman, Vice President, Housing Finance Policy at the Urban Institute. Lori founded the Housing Finance Center in 2018. This center is dedicated to providing policymakers with independent data-driven analyses of housing finance policy issues. Before joining the Urban Institute, Goodman spent 30 years as a research analyst and manager at a number of Wall Street firms, including Amherst Securities Group and UBS. Lori was honored as an inductee of the Fixed Income Analyst Hall of Fame in 2009. She has published more than 200 journal articles and co-authored and co-edited five books. She has published more than 200 journal articles and has co-authored and co-edited five books. Her, her credentials include a BA in mathematics from the University of Pennsylvania and a master's and PhD in economics from the Stanford University. Welcome, Lori. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on today. For our audience, this episode, we will continue to explore loan modifications. Lori, as we know, forbearance expiration is presently scheduled for June of this year. Whether the executive office will extend that or not is unknown. But nonetheless, it is a matter of when, not if, that forbearance ends. So naturally, on everyone's mind is how will loss mitigation play out? So my first question to you, during both the COVID-19 pandemic and the great financial crisis, the number of delinquencies swelled. Is the COVID-19 pandemic different from the great financial crisis? It's very different. Yes, the number of delinquencies have swelled in both cases. MBA data indicates that while overall, the number of serious delinquencies is lower than it was in the wake of the great financial crisis, the number of FHA VA serious delinquencies is higher than it was then. The big difference this time around is that the housing market has held up very well. During the great financial crisis, home prices deteriorated from 2006 to 2012, down 25% from peak to trough, according to Black Lip Night. By contrast, home prices were already increasing going into COVID-19, and these increases have accelerated. Home prices are up over 11% over the past year, bringing the total increase since the 2012 trough to 73%. And while that 11% per annum increase may not be sustainable, I believe home prices will continue to rise because we have a supply-demand imbalance. We are not creating enough net new homes to cover new household formation. The net supply of homes is new single family homes plus new multifamily homes plus manufactured housing, less obsolescence. The net supply of these homes is less than the number of new households. As a result, most borrowers, including distressed borrowers, will have equity in their home. In addition, courtesy of the great financial crisis plus a series of natural disasters, we have made major enhancements to our loss mitigation toolkit. So was there a difference in the timing and sense of urgency of the intervention between the great financial crisis and this one? Yes, the sense of urgency and the timing of the intervention was very different during the two periods. The government learned a very important lesson in the great financial crisis. It's important to move quickly to avoid contagion and not worry so much about minimizing moral hazard in which borrowers who did not need the relief would take advantage of the programs because it was advantageous to do so. In the great financial crisis, there was a delay before the seriousness of the situation was recognized and a further delay as policies were negotiated for the first time with a heavy lens toward minimizing moral hazard. With COVID-19, the toolkit was already in place and there was less worry about minimizing moral hazard as it turned out to be a largely a non-event during the great financial crisis. As a result, forbearance policies were put into place immediately by FHA, VA, and the GSEs. In fact, the forbearance policies were already in place when they were formalized by the first CARES Act at the end of March of 2020. The borrower needed only to attest to their need for relief. There was no paperwork. Moreover, there was a recognition that borrowers were hindered coming out of the great financial crisis by the damage done to their credit scores as a result of missed payments. 
During COVID, there are codes used to report forbearance to the credit rating agencies, essentially freezing the old pay history and not counting payments missed in forbearance as delinquent for credit reporting purposes. By contrast, while the economy was going into a tailspin in 2007, the Federal Reserve did not put programs into place until mid-2008 and did not buy mortgage-backed securities until late 2008, leaving the mortgage market with limited capacity and non-bank originators unable to finance their positions. This time around, the Fed was buying securities in mid-March of 2020, and by late March, they had pledged to purchase more agency mortgage-backed securities in an amount necessary to support smooth functioning markets. The financial market certainly stabilized very quickly, as you indicated. Now about the economy. What do you think will be the key drivers to an economic recovery? The financial market stabilized in large part because of massive Federal Reserve intervention, both directly to the markets through Federal Reserve intervention in the mortgage-backed securities and treasury markets, through Federal Reserve and Treasury borrowing programs such as the term asset-backed lending facility, and through direct stimulus payments to borrowers, which assured the market that the government would provide the needed support. The economic recovery is clearly in process. While the unemployment rate has come, come down substantially from 14.8% to 6%, it's still considerably above pre-pandemic levels of 3.5%. And there are many who are not included in that unemployment rate as they're not looking for work. The unemployment rate will decline further as more of the population receives vaccinations. The sectors of the economy that are closed or are at reduced capacity continue to reopen. And as students return to school full-time and consistently, allowing their parents to return to their offices. I would expect the bulk of the recovery to occur by September, October, but there will be a long tail on the ballots. The economic recovery could get derailed if there's an acceleration of hybrid strains of COVID or forcing renewed lockdowns. Assuming the economic recovery continues, it's important to realize that there have been structural changes in the economy as a result of COVID. People will travel less for business, they will shop more online, they will come into the office less frequently. These structural changes mean certain industries will have permanently lower employment and many people will not get their old jobs back. Other industries which require different skills will have permanently higher employment and may scramble to find workers. So now back to our borrowers. How has the loss mitigation toolkit to help these homeowners change between the great financial crisis and this crisis? The toolkit itself is much more developed now. While in the aftermath of the great financial crisis, there was a forbearance option. It was meant for borrowers whose change in circumstances was temporary. There was a separate path, a mortgage modification for borrowers who had a permanent change in circumstances. The link between the forbearance path and the more permanent modification path was cumbersome or non-existent. This time around, borrowers get forbearance for up to 18 months. Once that period ends, there are a number of options. First, borrowers who can increase their monthly payment will be asked to pay back their foreborn amount in a lump sum over a relatively small number of years. Borrowers who can make their pre-COVID mortgage payment will make that payment, and the foreborn amount will be added to the end of the life of the mortgage. This is known as the deferral option. In government securities, it is done as a soft second. In GSE securities, the term will be extended by the number of months in forbearance. Note that this represents a real break for the borrower as a dollar 30 years from now is worth 41 cents today, assuming a 3% interest rate. Borrowers that cannot make their old payment will be considered for a mortgage modification. The borrower will have their interest rate reduced to a market rate of interest and their term extended to 30 years. If this is insufficient, FHA and USDA borrowers are eligible for a partial claim to cover the foreborn amount and if this is insufficient, the borrower may potentially qualify for FHA HAMP, allowing for a larger partial claim and some additional forbearance, further reducing their payments. VA loans are more problematic as there is no partial claim. At the end of the day, some borrowers will not be able to sustain a mortgage modification and will lose their home. However, the menu of foreclosure alternatives is much better developed with borrowers who have no equity able to do some sort of cash for keys program in which the borrower vacates the property at a negotiated time 
with a lump sum relocation allowance rather than an eviction. So that's encouraging that the toolkit has been advanced this time around. How do we currently in forbearance to be resolved? How do you expect the outcomes to be different than those of the great financial crisis? There are two differences this time around. First and more important, most borrowers will have equity in their home courtesy of robust home price appreciation. Thus, fewer homes will go through foreclosure. If you're a homeowner with positive equity in your home, you'd rather sell your home yourself in order to preserve the equity. Second, the loss mitigation toolkit, which we have just discussed, is better developed. As I mentioned earlier, the waterfall when the borrower exits forbearance offers both deferral and mortgage modification options. And for those borrowers who fit into neither program, few will be foreclosed upon. Black Knight estimates that overall, only 10% of the borrowers in forbearance have less than 10% equity. This number rises to 15% if you assume all borrowers in forbearance have 12 months of deferred payments. For FHA VA mortgages, the number is higher at 19 and 26% respectively. Even so, the overwhelming majority of borrowers will have more than 10% equity. The larger issue will be borrowers who are delinquent and not in forbearance. Even so, the numbers are very limited, and these are mostly pre-COVID delinquencies. Black Knight data indicates approximately 2.2 million borrowers across the mortgage market, including FHA, VA, GSE, bank portfolio, and PLS securities, who are more than 90 days delinquent or in foreclosure. Out of these 2.2 million borrowers, more than one and a half million of these were not seriously delinquent going into COVID-19, and 700,000 of them were seriously delinquent going into COVID-19. Of these 1.5 million borrowers that were in good shape going into COVID-19, only 60,000 have either never been in forbearance or were in forbearance and have fallen out. Out of the 700,000 loans that were seriously delinquent prior to COVID-19, about two thirds are in forbearance or in a loss mitigation program. The last third have never been in a forbearance program or have fallen out. Thus, the total number of loans pre and post COVID that are seriously delinquent but not in forbearance is in the neighborhood of around 300,000 with about 240,000 of these pre-COVID delinquencies. Assistance is available to borrowers not in forbearance, but in most cases, the servicer simply can't make contact with the borrowers to provide the assistance to which they are entitled. Are there steps that you would take to improve the mortgage modification for FHA and USDA loans? Yes, as a public policy goal, we want to minimize the number of borrowers that are unable to make their old payment and will lose their homes. Borrowers are able to stay in their home through permanent reductions due to mortgage modifications. Currently, to oversimplify a bit, the way FHA HAMP modifications are done is to capitalize the foreborn amount into the loan balance, re-extend the term to 30 years, and bring down the interest rate to a market rate of interest. The servicer then looks at this payment and compares it to the target payment, which is a 20% reduction in total payments, including both principal and interest in taxes and insurance. However, the borrower can't pay more than 31% of their income or less than 20% of the income, so the reduction is adjusted accordingly. FHA guidelines allow the borrower to forbear principal up to 30% of the current principal amount to meet this target payment. If the modification does not meet these parameters, it is not offered. The real issue is that these steps oftentimes don't produce a 20% payment reduction. That is, a relatively new borrower with, say, a 29-year mortgage at a rate not too different than today's rate and a full 18 months in arrearages would get a limited payment reduction, well less than the 20% target. It's important to realize that by statute, the FHA and USDA have limited flexibilities. They cannot extend the term to 40 years, which would lower the payment because investors simply wouldn't accept this at a reasonable rate. They don't have a portfolio, so loans can't be handled on a one-off on one basis. However, there are a few steps that could be helpful. First, rather than lowering the payments over the balance of the life of the loan, use the 30% partial claim amount to do a payment reduction for the first five years then have the payment reset up to the original amount in stages, similar to the old HAMP modifications. 
Ideally, the borrower would choose whether a lower payment for a period of time or the traditional FHA modification suits them better. Second, while not currently in the public discourse, FHA could forgive the mortgage insurance premium on all modified mortgages or on certain modified mortgages. While neither of these is a silver bullet, both of these steps could meaningfully help. I understand they can achieve lower interest rates with the steps that you recommended. But what about VA modifications? You indicated earlier that VA modifications were more difficult than that of the FHA. Yes, VA modifications are much more difficult than FHA modifications, as there's no partial claim. Thus, the servicer is not reimbursed for foreborn amounts when they do a deferral. More critically, from the borrower's perspective, the scope to lower payments in a modification is very limited. They can lower to a market rate of interest and extend the term to 30 years, but that's it. That means that military personnel receive much fewer substantial modifications than FHA, USDA, or GSE borrowers, which just seems unfair. This is a population that should receive more favorable treatment, not less. One solution is that Treasury could think about funding the equivalent of a partial claim for VA, the borrower would owe this amount at the end of the life of the mortgage. It would function as a second lien, just as it does for FHA mortgages. I understand it seems unfair for the veterans. Hopefully, the administration can work on some adjustments to the VA toolkit. What about borrowers who are going to be unable to retain their home? Is the toolkit in the right place for them? As a result of the great financial crisis, we have a well-documented toolkit of foreclosure alternatives such as short sales, deeds in lieu of foreclosure, claims without conveyance of title, et cetera. In all these alternatives, the borrower is given a small relocation allowance in exchange for giving up their home, which has no equity. This time, borrowers have substantial equity, as we've talked about earlier. Usually when a borrower has equity, they sell the home themselves. They usually coordinate with a realtor to maximize returns. However, there are going to be many borrowers who are behind on their payments, who don't know what their home is worth, and don't know whether they should go this route or not. A bit of handholding for these borrowers would be very helpful. I would suggest the following. If the borrower does not have a realtor, the servicer gives them several referrals you might consider. The realtor helps the borrower establish a market value for the home and a timetable for sale. If the home does not sell in the suggested time frame, the realtor urges the borrower to consider either an iBuyer or an auction sale. And then the borrower is given a small payment for relocation expenses. Question, why would you pay a borrower with equity? It's important to realize that there are heavy transactions costs associated with the foreclosure. Giving these funds to the borrower would be a graceful exit and would save these costs, so it would be very logical. We have covered a lot of ground on this podcast. Overall, I sense you are very optimistic about the exit from forbearance. You think the deferrals for those that can maintain their pre-COVID payments and mortgage modifications for those who cannot will work out for a majority of the borrowers now in forbearance, and most of the remaining borrowers have equity, correct? Yes. Um, however, as we discussed, I think there are steps that can be taken to improve the FHA and USDA modification toolkits, even given existing parameters. These include more flexible use of the partial claim to reduce the payment for a period of time and waiving the FHA insurance premium. For VA mortgages, the equivalent of the FHA partial claim is needed as military personnel get worse treatment in a modification than any other borrower. Finally, ideally, you would want to provide additional support to borrowers with equity that will be unable to retain their home. Well, it looks like that's all the time we have for today. Lori, thank you for your time and sharing your thoughts and insights on a complicated topic. Certainly, we hope that the recommendations you have pointed out are heard by those that can affect them. Thank you very much, Lori. John, thanks so much for having me on today. That was Lori Good, Vice President of Housing Finance Policy. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to future episodes of Capital Markets Live on YouTube. If you have any comments or questions about today's episode or other topics, please send us an email at ocmglobalinvestorinquiries at hud.gov. Again, 
Thanks for listening. And until next time, stay healthy.